You've talked about dietary protein a lot. And it's oh, really? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and how it is extremely important for our muscle health. So let's talk about what is the optimal amount of protein and macronutrient sort of profile for a person who's looking to optimize their muscular health. Yes. Um, this is probably my favorite topic, and I've been talking about it for 20 years. And surprisingly, you would think I would be sick of talking about it. No. But I, I'm actually not because here's why. You know, you were on my podcast and we were chatting. And I think being a physician is a privilege. And I think being a well-trained physician is a privilege. And I have a unique perspective because I trained in nutritional sciences for seven years. And also trained as a geriatrician. For those listening, it's typically over the age of 65. It is all about muscle health and aging, those things. I mean, we do this in clinic as just metrics. And dietary protein is probably the most controversial nutrition topic. We're going to cover some of those myths. So, but <laughs> so, but we're going to talk about well, what is protein? Well, protein. We don't actually need protein. We need the amino acids. There's 20 different amino acids, nine of which are essential, all of which have various needs. They are not. Um, there's limiting amino acids, and they're not equally limiting. And why this is important is because when it comes to muscle health, we're going to, I'm sure, talk about leucine, which is one of the amino acids necessary for muscle health. But I'm going to frame up for the listener the one thing that they can do. And that is, they're going to think this is too much, but just hang with me here, one gram per pound ideal body weight. That's on the high end. And people are going to think one gram per pound ideal body weight. Well, what's my ideal body weight? Last time you felt great. And maybe that was college. I don't know. But it's something very simple to do. Now, I think it's also important to mention that people have probably heard about the RDA, which is the recommended dietary allowance. That number is set to prevent deficiencies. That number is 0.8 grams per kilogram. That comes out to 0.37 grams per pound. So let me put this in perspective. If you are a 115 pound person, that's 45 grams of protein. That's the minimum to prevent deficiencies. We don't want to be minimum. No, and that's a really great point. That is not actually going to support aging. And these uh, recommendations haven't changed for decades. It's not going to be growing our skeletal muscles, which is what we need to do to prevent that decline, that's right? That's exactly right. Yeah. And something else happens. It's also important to recognize that that minimum was also based on high quality proteins. So the sources of proteins, and they were considered, so what we consider a high quality protein is something that comes from animal-based sources, not for any other reason other than hard, fast biological numbers. And so that minimum of 0.8 grams per kilogram comes from high quality proteins. And I think that that's important to mention because as individuals move more plant-based, you have to recognize that you're going to need more total protein to account for um, the missing amino acids, the amino acids, the bioavailability, those kinds of things. So let's let's talk about some of the misconceptions that people have. All of them. <laughs> yes. One is uh, well, the big ones. Okay. So I can't digest that much protein. So yes, and you know I don't know where this came from, don't know but <laughs> this is this idea that that would be the same uh, the same as saying, well, I can't metabolize that much testosterone. Well, you metabolize in some way or another all the testosterone in your body. It's being utilized for something. Okay, could it be bound? Yes, but your body is going to utilize it all. The idea that you can only absorb or digest 30 grams of protein, there's no evidence to support that. You digest and absorb all the protein that you ingest. The question then becomes, where does that excess protein go mm -hmm. and what is the benefit? Above, say, 55 grams of dietary protein at one meal, um, and you could think about that as a six ounce steak or six and a half or seven ounce steak, your body will max out its effect on skeletal muscle at around 55 grams, but the rest is still utilized, whether it's for tissue turnover, whether it's for hormone production, you name it, but the body uses all of it. And what about the misconception that protein is bad for my kidneys? Um, there have been multiple meta-analyses saying and showing that actually supports healthy kidney function. 
All right. The other one that comes up often is you shouldn't eat that much if you're not using it. Like if you're not training and say you're just living your regular daily life, like there's no need for that much protein because I'm not going to the gym. Right. And I would say um, as you age, the tissue changes and it becomes something called uh, more anabolically resistant and it becomes less sensitive to the signaling of dietary protein. And when you think about it, the way to overcome that is through increasing dietary protein. And the evidence supports double the RDA for a more optimal level, 1.6 grams per kilogram. And that's actually the minimum that I would recommend individuals ingest. And that's closer to uh, 0.7 grams per pound. So you're you know, yeah. upticking higher amounts of protein. Because you have to understand, why are we eating protein? We're eating protein because we have to support overall protein turnover. Protein turnover is not just muscle, it's everything. And the body turns over around 300 grams a day. And we only eat, what, the average male eats about 100 grams of protein a day. So the body, I just want to make sure people heard yeah. that, the body turns over 300 grams of protein That's a day. That's right. And we are eating, so the average woman will eat 68 grams of protein, and the average male will eat about 100 grams of protein. Yeah, and I will say I've been weighing my foods more recently, and you'd be shocked at how like little we actually like. So you go out to eat, and you order like say anything with chicken or or beef or whatever. Like it's not a lot. The no. amount of protein you're getting is really small. I know, and we have to think that when you eat a protein forward diet, you protect skeletal muscle. There's only two major ways to stimulate skeletal muscle. Number one through exercise, which is arguably the most effective just because of the mechanical loading and the cascade of events that happen after that. But the other way to stimulate skeletal muscle is through diet. And that's something that 100% of people do is they eat. Yeah. And so you have to get that right. If you do nothing else, you have to create a foundation of a nutritional plan that is going to support aging. You know, and also on the contrary, you hear a lot of longevity experts talking about reducing dietary protein. Nothing could be more harmful to aging than reducing dietary protein. Yeah, where did they get that from? Um, <laughs> well, uh, some not great science, but also this idea that uh, it suppresses a pathway called this mTOR pathway, but it's not based in human data. Yes. And also, as practicing physicians, we have to think, okay, what does support health? Skeletal muscle mass supports health. If you recommend below the RDA, which we've already established is the minimum to prevent a deficiency, some longevity experts uh, recommend 0.3 grams per kilogram. That's you're not even you're not even preventing deficiency at that point, right? Yeah, and that is a huge myth. So um, maybe calorie restriction is a benefit, but again, the lower your calories get, the higher your protein intake needs to be. Again the body turns over 300 grams of protein a day. So even if you're not doing resistance training, protein intake in and of itself yes. is going to support skeletal yeah. muscle. And in fact, you know, we have used something called the protein sparing modified fast. Individuals that had to go through surgery or bariatric surgery, you name it, that needed to really affect body composition and, and maintain muscle mass and lean tissue, which also includes bone. Dietary protein is essential for that. You are not going to maintain those tissues, even with a tremendous amount of exercise, if you do not have protein on board, because you need those building blocks, you need those individual amino acids. So what I want to talk about before we talk about animal-based protein, there's a couple of things that you've mentioned that I've heard about. One is that actually eating more protein will improve your willpower. So we're always, people are always want to lose weight, right? The large majority of the country wants to lose weight. So if you tell me increasing, pro, eating more protein is going to help my willpower to calorie restrict and lose weight, that's really powerful. It is. You know, I've been in the nutrition space for 20 years. And one of the things that we always talk about is how do we design a diet so individuals are not suffering? Because for whatever reason, people find that hunger is an emergency, mm -hmm. which as we know, that's not. Maybe having to go to the bathroom on an airplane while you're strapped in and there's turbulence, that might be an emergency, but hunger is not an emergency. And one of the ways in which you design a diet is how do you affect gut hormones? How do you affect brain? And the way in which you do that in an effective way is through increasing dietary protein. And, and some of the early work came out of Heather Lighty's lab. And basically she looked at younger adolescents and she increased the dietary protein between 
35 to 40 grams at that first meal at breakfast. And what they found was on brain imaging is that that next meal, individuals were much less likely to pick up cake or something sweet. The reward systems on the, in the brain were not activated. So there's a satiating mechanism with dietary protein. Again, you're hearing a lot of discussion around GLP-1s, uh, but other hormones like CCK from the gut. These are an effective way to increase satiation just by increasing dietary protein. It's very difficult to overeat dietary protein for this reason. Yeah, I've heard you say it before, but like if you're hungry and you sit down with a chicken breast and you don't eat it, that means you're not hungry. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, that is the ultimate. But, you know, you might sit down with a bag of popcorn. You're like popcorn or uh, chicken breast. Which, which one are you going to go for? Yeah. If you're not hungry, there's no way you're going to eat that dried chicken breast. Yeah, but if you're hungry, you'll eat anything. Um. <laughs> or if you're eating for uh, hedonic reasons, mm -hmm. which people eat for a lot of other reasons other than hunger. Mm -hmm. um, and there's something very interesting called the protein leverage hypothesis. I don't know if you've heard about mm -hmm. it. And it's really fascinating. And this is that the, the human and actually across animal species will eat to a certain level of protein. And it comes out to be roughly 20% protein, maybe a little bit less. But one of the reasons why this group and it's Simpson and um, his colleague uh, believe that obesity has become such a problem is because of the ultra processed foods and the high palatable foods and less protein intake that people will continue to eat. This drive for food is actually a drive for amino acids. Wow. That's, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So you, of course, correct. So you've, in terms of dietary protein intake, how should you spread it out through your day? There is a lot of contention around this topic. And I know that that probably seems silly. People go from one meal a day to two meals a day. And I really fault in part my mentor, Dr. Donald Lehman, because him and Doug Patton Jones did some of these original studies that talked about protein distribution. And protein distribution was 30 grams of protein three times a day. But I think it's really important to recognize the backstory as to where this came from. And what they found was initially individuals that followed a normal American eating plan which was a low protein breakfast, we'll say 12 grams of protein, a moderate protein lunch, maybe 20 to 30 grams of protein, and a big protein dinner where you have your steak and potatoes. Those individuals with, that were backloading protein, when you redistributed protein to the first meal of the day and the last meal of the day, that their body composition changed by doing nothing other than redistributing the macronutrients. So I want people to take a moment and listen to this. So if you look at the studies that are isocaloric, meaning they had both groups, uh, and I worked on some of these early studies, both groups had the same amount of calories. So let's just call it 1,500 calories. One group backloaded protein and had um, lower protein breakfast, moderate protein lunch, and then a high protein dinner. When you redistributed those calories from protein to that first meal of the day and equally throughout the rest of the day, they saw body composition changes a loss in body fat and an increase in lean tissue by doing nothing else than changing the way in which they distributed the calories. That's amazing. That's, 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 I mean, that's amazing. Yeah. So the question becomes- And they were measuring this with DEXA scans? They were measuring it with DEXA scans. Um, and then the, the next question is how sensitive were those scans, right? So you need a significant amount of change to be able to, or meaningful amount of change to be able to determine outcomes, especially as individuals age. So when you have your first meal of the day between 30 to 50 grams of protein, you're coming out of an overnight fast, you stimulate the mechanisms that are responsible for muscle protein synthesis. For any physicians listening or individuals that are uh, involved in healthcare, muscle protein synthesis is a way in which we measure, it's a biomarker for muscle health. So you either turn it on or you don't. And lower protein intakes below a certain threshold do not stimulate muscle protein synthesis. And what happens is, is sarcopenia or obesogenic sarcopenia is a huge problem. We know the majority of individuals are obese. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's crazy. The majority of our population are so either sad. overweight or obese. So if you can imagine what percentage of those individuals have healthy skeletal muscle, I would argue that the majority of them don't. And if we do not correct not just what we eat, but how we eat, the loss of skeletal muscle mass is going to be clear. But if we can redistribute protein, then you can change 
body outcomes. And there's one more important thing to mention about dietary protein, which I think is underappreciated, is this idea that protein has this thermic effect of food, thermic effect of feeding. So when you eat fat, you store a large majority of the fat. When you eat carbohydrates, you know, you utilize all of it, but protein, when you eat protein in this distributed way, because it stimulates muscle, you will use 20% of that food. For example, if you have 100 calories from dietary protein and you eat um, between 30 and 50, I'm just picking 100, then you'll get a net gain of 80 calories because 20% of those calories will be utilized, whether it's digestion, absorption, but probably because of the stimulation of skeletal muscle. Because again, skeletal muscle is a nutrient sensing organ system. And yeah. that is practical and very easy to understand to change body composition. We haven't even talked about exercise, specifically the combination of diet and exercise. Yeah, so you've said, uh, and you said 30 grams three times, a, or. Totally. Distributed is, throughout three yeah. three meals. I've heard you say 50 grams in the morning, 50 grams at dinner. Yeah. And then that's more important than the 30 throughout yes. the day. Yes. Why is um, that? Because that first and that last meal are the most important. I um, understand the first meal. What I think I'm struggling with is the last meal. Because you're going into overnight fast. Got it. Got it. And if you have a, a protein amount, especially as you age, that is sub-threshold, so let's say 20 grams. Of protein and you know you might hear some other protein experts say well that 20 grams is going to be enough I think when an individual is aging or suffering with low levels of inflammation or obese or any kind of chronic condition you require a certain amount of protein to stimulate that tissue and so by dosing it appropriately just think about how we dose medicine we stimulate that tissue and we know that you're going into an overnight fast and that becomes critical you're not having ebbs and flows of blood sugar. Hopefully you shouldn't be. Because part of protein will generate glucose. And you generate glucose through a process called gluconeogenesis. For every 100 grams of protein, you might generate 60 grams of carbohydrate. But it's slower, it's less efficient, and you're not dependent on dietary carbohydrates to maintain blood sugar. Mm. Yeah, it's releasing, in, as you mentioned, in a more steady fashion. Absolutely. You're not getting those spikes. Yeah, and you have to support whole body turnover. If you hit the health of skeletal muscle by between 30 to 50 grams of protein, everything else falls into place because you've now guaranteed yourself a robust amount of, again, these amino acids, which every, you know, all 20 amino acids have diverse biological roles. And when you hit that, then, you know, you hit skeletal muscle, but now you've provided your body enough to get all the other needs met. If you enjoyed this clip of the Rena Malik MD podcast, make sure you check out the full episode with my friend, Dr. Gabrielle Lyon, right here.